Hi, everybody. John Sporn, and welcome to this week's edition of Wine Uncensored. So this week, we're going out to Napa Valley to try some of um, arguably the best sparkling wine in the US um, from Schramsberg Vineyards. And we're delighted to have with us tonight Hugh Davies. Um, he is now running Schramsberg um, and um, also an associated uh, winery, uh, Jay Davies. And we're going to be tasting uh, three of their wines tonight. So Hugh, why don't you introduce yourself for us? Fantastic, John. Thank you for the, the warm welcome. Great to be with you from uh, the Schramsberg Cave. Actually, I'm in uh, portal number two here. Um, I'm actually right up at the front of the cave so that our signal is, is strong. But you have a look behind me uh, where we have a bunch of 2018 vintage sparkling wines stacked behind. But uh, great to be with you to represent my family and, and our winery. Great, great. So um, I know we put together a little sh uh, screen uh, presentation here. So let me go ahead and bring that up for everybody. Okay. And um, there we go. And um, of course, your, your logo and founded 1862. Now, this is when the actual um, winery, is this when your family started with it or much no. later? So Schramsberg is, an, is uh, really one of the, the oldest wineries, uh, most historic wineries in California. Uh, I think everybody's aware that 1862 was, was a long time ago, as it turns out. Uh, 159 years ago, I guess, uh, the, this coming year. So um, the original winery was founded by German immigrants. Uh, they were the Schrams or the Schrams, uh, and Schramsberg would have been Schrams Mountain. So that was the name of this, this property that they would establish. Uh, they were among the very first vintners in, in California, uh, and uh, for that matter here in the Napa Valley. Uh, they would not do still wine or sparkling wines in that earlier era, but made some delicious still wines, uh, both white wines and red wines, and then had about a 50 year run of activity leading up until the time of prohibition. Uh, so we're, we're dealing with a, a, a difficult time period uh, right now, but I can assure you for, for people that were in the wine business, prohibition <laughs> was really bad. Uh, we would not have been in business. And, and in fact, uh, that's what happened with the trams. They would eventually sell the property and uh, it, it, it changed hands a few times. My parents would move to Napa Valley, revive the old Tramsburg winery some 50 years after it had been closed. And that was in 1965. And so they were uh, somewhat visionary, uh, very uh, energetic, uh, uh, devoted to, 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 to this, this business that they would revive. And, and, and their, their vision was uh, bottle fermented sparkling wine. Uh, they were the first producers in the United States to use the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir grapes, which are the really the two top varietals out of the Champagne district in France, but grown here in California uh, in, in, the, uh, in this North Coast region where we, where we work. Um, and uh, we have uh, pushed, pushed the sled pretty hard and have had a, a, a good run of success now for over 50 years as a sparkling producer. Thank you to, to all of you who enjoy our wines and help keep us going. I have to say I've had more than my share of, of Schramsberg bottles. So. Um, so here's a picture, I guess this is the original. Um, yeah, that would have been one, an iteration of, of uh, from, from one point, it's interesting to look at that label, Schramsberger is of Schramsberg, so the ER implies of Schramsberg, and uh, it's labeled as a Burgundy, and so presumably a, a, a red wine, right? I don't have uh, full bottles <laughs> of, of the Schramsberger Burgundy to taste with you, but uh, uh, that would give you a sense, you know, the, the, some of the whites were all also labeled with a kind of a, a French name, Chablis, but they would also uh, work with Riesling. I would say the principal white varietal of, the, of that era was Riesling, a German varietal, and some of the early vintners here were in fact Germans, Schramm among them. Um, Zinfandel, Darif, uh, Chasselas is another varietal that uh, you know, we have some varietally labeled bottles of, uh, or old, old labels, images of. Uh, I wish that we had more inventory from that time, but we really just don't. It would be interesting, yeah, because because even though it said Burgundy, you know, unlike today, it, it doesn't mean that it came from Burgundy or even has Pinot Noir in it, right? It was just a red wine at that time. So. Honestly, when I was a kid growing up in the, in the, I was born in the 60s, but really growing up in the 70s, um, there were quite a few California wines that still uh, uh, carried those labels, right? Chablis meant white wine, Burgundy meant red wine, that's it. And, and whatever varietal you wanted to use was fine. We have moved away from that uh, labeling, that kind of thinking. And, and so you, you, 
is kind of an image from the past. And because um, even then, because you and I are, are roughly the same age and um, the sparkling wine would have been called a, a champagne or a pink champagne, even coming out of California. That absolutely, there still are some, uh, you know, U.S. sparkling wines that, that like to use the term champagne on their labels. Uh, if they have been doing so for uh, an extended period of time, they're grandfathered in. But at one point, there was a, 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 an agreement between the French and the U.S. authorities that, that, that says that if you jump into the sparkling business now, you cannot use that champagne term because, of course, that, that, that is a region in France, something like Napa is a region in, in, in California. Uh, so we, we get it. We, although back in the 60s when we started, absolutely, it was Schramsberg Champagne, uh, Schramsberg Napa Valley Champagne. Uh, if you called it sparkling wine, that didn't sound as good. <laughs> and it's crazy things that still might not to some people, right? It's, 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 not, it's not the real champagne. It's like, hey, you know, so we've always had a little bit of that, uh, that challenge. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, the last 10, 15 years that there seems to have been uh, uh, increased interest in what we're doing. And for that, we're very thankful. That's true. I mean, because I've, I've had sparkling wines are much better than some champagne. So, I mean, it's... Absolutely. I mean, people may think, really? No question about it, right? Uh, and, and I mean, I could bore you with some of those details, but the, 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 the region that we work with today is pretty outstanding. So we're, we're not necessarily just a Napa Valley sparkling wine producer. The, the fruit that we work with grows in the very coolest part of the Napa Valley, just in the Carnarvon district at the north end of the bay. And then we do even more, especially with Pinot, out towards the coast. So we're up in the Anderson Valley, Mendocino County, down through different uh, very cool coastal pockets of Sonoma County, into Marin County, uh, in areas where there, frankly, there were no vineyards in the 60s or really even into the 70s. And it's it's evolved it, and it continues to. A uh, part of uh, our our, our vision, our mission, if you will, is to, to continually try uh, some new sites uh, to have uh, access to a little bit of new fruit, if you will, every single vintage as, as we continue to try to push that envelope um, and fine tune our, our, our program. And, and uh, uh, what we have with these coastal sites is this ability to retain really high levels of acidity, natural acidity in the fruit. And that uh, enables them to be really crisp, palate cleansing, you know, on the one hand, refreshing with the fruit, but, but dry and crisp with the natural acidity. And then they also age beautifully. So one of the selections we have tonight is uh, uh, 2012, right? So over eight years old, um, we're doing more selections like that. Frankly, even some things that are 10, 15, 20 years <laughs> age in a cave like this, pretty cool. So uh, not that everybody knows that, but that, that at the very highest level, you know, kind of that's what the sparkling producers are thinking about, whether they're in California or somewhere in Champaign. And that's why we do these kind of shows is to get people to understand that, you know, you don't have to have a, a sparkler that's just out today. You can drink vintages from years past and they can be delicious and often case even better with a little bit of age on them. So absolutely. They get more expensive. Well, of course, as a producer, yeah. we like that, we like that, but, but it is, it is, uh, uh, you know, we, we will get to the Cabernet towards the, you know, the end of the program after we taste through uh, some of the sparklings. But it's, it's interesting. And I know for my, my parents, very perplexing always was that as when they started, uh, frankly, champagne was a little bit more expensive than red and white wine. Yeah. And over the course of the last 50 some years, right, red wine, definitely in our part of the world, whoa, you know, got a little more expensive. Nothing more expensive than Napa Valley Cabernet in, uh, in, in the California wine scene, right? right. And uh, well, at one point we started making our own Napa Valley Cabernet. Uh, so, but but it's but it, you know for the work that we put into making these sparkling wines, then you age it for ten years, and and uh, okay, we get a premium price, but it's not not quite the same as uh, you know selling a Cabernet that's three years old at the same price. Let's see. So here you are, you are officially a historic um, landmark in California, the, the Schramsberg Estate. So. Um, it's not just property. If you'll note, they're visited by Robert Louis Stevenson, so the the famous author uh, from Scotland who, who wrote uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde and Treasure Island. But he also wrote a book called The Silverado Squatters, noted there. And so uh, this was one of those spots that uh, uh, Stevenson visited in 1880. Uh, and uh, 
that was obviously significant in 1957 when this plaque was placed on the wall, uh, but an interesting part of our history as well. And then this is the original Schomsburg house. Now, I know you've updated it and, and restored it, but this is the original Schomsburg house, correct? So. Correct. So that home would have been built in the 1880s. Uh, there, you know, the family was obviously living on the proper property prior to that. But at one point, uh, you know, enough success had, had evolved that they were able to in, invest in, in this home. Pretty cool house. Uh, it's interesting for me to, to uh, present that to you. I grew up in that house. I uh, was one of three kids. I was the youngest of three boys. And uh, as fate would have it, I'm now the father <laughs> in the house. And I've got three boys. Uh, but yeah, life goes on. Uh, we're we're tucked away in the hills up here. Oh, probably up uh, 650 feet above sea level, something like that. You know, so about a mile up off of the valley floor as you drive up Bar Canyon and and arrive at what we call Shramsbury. And so it's a short commute for you every morning. So I am one of those people who doesn't have to get in a car to drive to work. That is true. Uh, and. Uh, if I told you I didn't like that, I would definitely be lying. That's that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I, I now work never is too far away, right? So yeah, you know. But I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Yeah, you know, but you also, if you're thirsty in the, in, late at night, it's very easy for you to go down and grab a bottle too. So that is correct. I will never be without bottles of Schramsberg, Uh, But uh, yeah, we've got a few other bottles down in the cellar. <laughs> so we have wine. We do have wine. That's that is true. We have wine, we have water. Uh, we get a fair amount of rain up in our hills so that, that uh, even in a dry year, we have plenty of water around here. Uh, so that's uh, one of the, the uh, uh, another uh, remnant from that earlier time period. I, I wish that we had the old bottles of wine. We don't, but we have a number of old buildings. The caves that I'm in here, these would have been dug with picks and shovels back in the 1800s. Uh, Chinese labor uh, was was involved in establishing this winery, uh, you know, managing the vineyards and the and the process in terms of the winemaking in that earlier era uh, here and with other wineries, of course, in, in California. But that Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley, some of these areas really had uh, pretty good success going back, uh, uh, you know, over 100 years. You know, prior to prohibition, we know that Shram was selling wines in New York and in London and. You know, of course, St. Louis and Chicago and other other cities around the country as well. Um, interesting. And I think that's something people forget that the California wine trade existed worldwide. Before, you know, in the 1800s and early 1900s. I mean, Absolutely. some of the wines were very famous in Europe. Um, but then, you know, we went into this little experiment called prohibition and pretty much destroyed. Uh, the wine culture in California and allowed the rest of the world to continue moving forward. And then, you know, we had to play catch up all of a sudden, right? So. Absolutely. Prohibition lasted for 13 years, right? So then there was a, there was a, you know, kind of a period leading up to prohibition that, that was not particularly good for, for wineries either as the, the breaks were being placed, you know, on, on the, um, on, on the, on the, on the industry. Uh, we also had at that time, of course, you know, uh, nobody was alive today. It was really alive then, in, in, in that you know, let's say the, the first decade of the 20th century. But phylloxera was uh, devastating. So that rootless, or excuse me, wingless uh, uh, root louse, this insect, was devastating vineyards uh, throughout the world, including here in California. And so a lot of replanting was undertaken, and it was it was a difficult time. They, they didn't didn't have a handle on how to resolve that situation, uh, frankly, until uh, you know, decades later. Well, you know what? Let's um, let's get people something to drink here. So great idea. So we will start our tasting tonight with the Blanc de Blanc. This wine is uh, you know, kind of the classic Transburg, if you will. The uh, the very first vintage that we produced was the '65 Blanc de Blanc. We made 200 cases uh, that year. Today, uh, you know the probably 35,000 cases, something like that. So we've grown a bit more with, uh, with our Blanc de Blanc, um, but really a, a delightful uh, style, very crisp, 
um, lighter in body than some of the other brute styles is this one is made 100% from the Chardonnay grape, right? So Blanc de Blanc white wine from the, the white grape. So I have a half bottle here, which I presume many of you folks have as well from the 2016 vintage. Um, I've always vintage dated the sparkling wine. You know, I think that's an interesting uh, concept uh, for people to consider the vast majority of sparkling wine, whether it's made in, in, in California, um, made in France, uh, uh, you know, somewhere else in the world is non-vintage, right? It's, it's non-vintage, you really buy the brand and you buy a non-vintage brut. And so you don't really know too much more about it. How, how old is it? What, what specific year uh, did it come from? What were the specific varietals that were used, you know, or in, in what percentages uh, were, were they used in making the blend? Uh, my parents wanted to, uh, you know, kind of take, I think, the sparkling category up a little bit, certainly for the United States, but to some degree, you know, to turn, turn that back. We're going to make vintage dated sparkling wine, and, and, and here we're going to make varietal uh, sparkling wine as well. So this is a Chardonnay, sparkling Chardonnay. Um, and uh, I'll open this bottle and we'll give it a taste. Uh, you should find that there will be a really crisp entry in terms of the, the palate, uh, very long lingering finish, uh, elevated acidity, Chardonnay naturally will, uh, will, will retain a bright, crisp, uh, uh, natural acidity that, that gives us uh, that, that, that really nice linear structure on the palate. To the aroma, you'll also uh, uh, note some, some very attractive character. And here, uh, 2016, so a wine that is four years old, a little more than four years old. Um, there's, a, there's a brightness of fruit, certainly. Uh, uh, Chardonnay, from the, the standpoint of making this style of wine, is picked uh, early in the season. Uh, the city wants to be quite high, uh, but the, 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 the level of sugar is a little lower. So the alcohol in these, these wines is also quite low. But you have, uh, over the course of time, some of that very uh, tart uh, citrus and apple type character that we start with as it gently bakes in the bottle, as it gently ages in the cellars here, you, it start, starts to caramelize and you, you get some really beautiful, you know, just, just baked fruit essences in the, uh, uh, the aromas uh, and the flavors of the wine. But uh, quite attractive, I think, it, it, at this point, in its, uh, still in its youth, this is a, a bottle of wine that will, will age beautifully, honestly, for uh, decades to come, you know, depending on what people are, are, are looking for. Now, do you, you don't put a disengorgement date on these or? We do not, it's vintage dated, so you know exactly how, how old this bottle is. If you're buying a bottle um, in a store, uh, then you have a, pretty good sense that it would have been disgorged within the, the last year or so. We, we, we start to ship the wine from the winery uh, about three to six months after the, the disgorging. As we, get, as we get towards the holidays, it's probably a little closer to three months because uh, there's a little extra pull, uh, as, as you're probably well aware, for sparkling wine in October, November, December. Um, and then, you know, it, it, this time of year, we're kind of rebuilding the inventory that's ready for the market, uh, uh, and then uh, and we continue. So we're always we're always finishing wine. We're always disgorging. We have uh, back to the process. There's the uh, there's the harvest time period where we where we harvest the fruit, and then we make the initial base wines. So that's August, September, potentially into October on a very late year. And then we have tanks and barrels full of very tart still wines that we've prepared. We'll then uh, in the spring come back and blend uh, the, the different elements that we've uh, uh, made. Uh, and then by April, we're ready to bottle the blended wine with a little bit of yeast, a little bit of sugar. The bottles go directly into the caves and then they ferment inside the bottle. Uh, but a very modest fermentation, right? We only bump the alcohol about 1% in that fermentation. Um, and then most of the life of the bottle in the cave is, is aging. It's, it's like taking the pie and sticking it into the oven. Normally that's gonna be a two or three hour exercise at what, 350 degrees. Uh, here, oh no, it's about uh, 59 degrees and it's years, <laughs> years that we'll actually wait and, and very gradually you'll, 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 you'll note the, the character evolve. As we get to the, the second sparkling, 
the rosé, you'll 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 have a sense for for what that additional age can can impart, you know, the character that it can impart in the wine. Now, do you age the half bottles differently than the the full bottles? They're similar, honestly, you know, in this case, probably about three years of age in contact with the yeast. Um, we are, uh, it, to, to be completely honest with you, uh, the half bottles, it's always, it, it seems like we have more half bottles than the world wants, or we don't have enough. <laughs> <laughs> we're actually starting to move into a, a moment when we're not going to have enough, which is unfortunate. I think one thing that happened during the pandemic, ironically, is that we started selling more half bottles. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, it's a wine that's sold through uh, restaurants more than stores, right? You know, it's, I, I can sell. And uh, so I don't have a good explanation for how it is that while restaurants are largely uh, uh, closed in parts of the country or otherwise compromised in terms of their, their uh, capacity, we're selling more half bottles, but uh, there you go. So now we're, we're, we're making more uh, from the 2020 vintage, but that doesn't do as much good in, in 2021, right? So I, can't, I cannot sell it this year. So you actually, for your half bottles, you actually do ferment it in the half bottle. You don't- We do, yep. We do the whole process in. So this very bottle uh, at, at one point was a fermenter. Uh, and so in that case here, 2016 in the, uh, uh, probably May of, of, six, of 17, we would have bottled the wine with a little bit of yeast and sugar. By June of 17, it was a sparkling wine, all right? And then it, then it just aged in contact with its yeast for the next three years. And then we riddled and disgorged. So the riddling is to, to turn the bottles uh, in order to get the, the yeast sediment to pack neatly into the crown of, of, of the bottle. We have and some then, great pictures of that. So let's show those. You might see that in some of those. So there's the Blonde de Blanc the label. Okay, and here's, you know, what we didn't mention is that you were also the first American sparkling wine to be served at the White House. And you continue to be served at the White House, so, right? I've been, uh, I've been a, 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 um, a great spot for us, <laughs> I would say. You know, the, again, back to this, the 60s, no one else was doing Chardonnay and Pinot based sparkling wine, right? So if you wanted a really premium bottle of, of of domestic sparkling wine, as my parents set it up, hey, we've got your answer, right? We made the Schramsberg sparkling wine and it's made like they do in Champagne with the Chardonnay or the Pinot Noir. So Nixon, who was from California, uh, uh, was the first president from California, Reagan was as well. Uh, both those presidents, frankly, helped to introduce a little bit more domestic wine into the, the, the affairs at the White House. And so, and, and that's there from California, obviously a fair amount of California sparkling wine. So this was a great uh, uh, stroke of fortune for us when Nixon went to China, actually, uh, in, in February of 1972, the, there was a, a week long series of meetings with Zhu Enlai, uh, with Mao, Chairman Mao, Nixon, Kissinger, the whole entourage was there. Uh, the beginning of the end of the Cold War was kind of crafted in terms of a, a peace treaty and then they raised a glass uh, uh, to a historic toast uh, that Sunday night after the week-long series of meetings. And it was Schramsberg in the glass. Or I should say, as Barbara Walters explained, the Schramsberg blank to blank <laughs> had been served. Yes, I have heard that. <laughs> so that was good. On, I mean, imagine the thrill for my parents watching the Today Show and and the and she was she had a bottle on Tiananmen Square on, on NBC, right? And that was during the time when we we had maybe three channels, right? Right. And so you yep. knew people were watching. <laughs> Absolutely. Is I I think some folks are a little. My kid, for example, no no concept, right? Right. There are an unlimited number of channels. No, there, frankly, in, in that White House we saw the picture of earlier, we had we had one channel when I was a kid. NBC. That's it. Um, they could reach we had a better antenna and maybe had not been stuck in the middle of a forest. Uh, okay, maybe we got a couple more. So we have a couple of people commenting on the $6.49 retail. of. <laughs> Those were the days. Uh, yeah, but honestly, a relative. So today, right, you know, a bottle of Blanc de Blanc might be $40, $35, $45. The, the, the reality is that $6.49 was more expensive then than $40 is today. So uh, we're, uh, if you guys are happy for us to raise our prices, we, we, we will. 
Well, let's um, move on from that. So. I've got kids. I've got to go to college, right? I'm, I'm trying my best. So um, here's, I have a couple of Riddlers, right? So the, there are, are a couple of happy Riddlers. Nice to see the smile. So Luisa and uh, Jesus. Uh, so Jesus Calderon in the background, he's kind of the master Riddler today at, at Stranford. Uh, prior to, to uh, Luisa and then Jesus uh, was Ramon Vieira. And Ramon turned the bottles in the caves actually for 41 years. So there's a, there's a tunnel behind us here that's named after Ramon. Uh, but yeah, these guys are, are great. We have a, we're blessed with a, a very uh, hardworking team, dedicated team. And there you see the, the process of turning the bottles. Those are A-framed riddling racks, we call them, or in France, they're referred to as the pupitre. Um, but the object is to turn the bottles by hand, a quarter turn a day to gradually nudge the yeast right into the, the neck of the bottle where we can freeze it into place. There you see the, the, the yeast being nudged although I can't turn those bottles, but the object is to slide all that yeast. It eventually goes down, yeah. Into the neck, and then we'll uh, freeze the, uh, I'll use this bottle as an example, but we'll, we'll ultimately, once it's riddled, we'll take this part of the bottle, dip that into a glycol solution that is liquid, but it's minus 10 degrees, and fairly quickly freezes in place the yeast, and at which point we can then turn the bottle right side up, pop the crown cap off. All these bottles behind me have crown caps, not corks. And the pressure that is built, built up from the fermentation will expel the, the plug of ice containing the yeast and you'll have a clear bottle of sparkling wine. So that technique we did not invent, right? I mean, there were folks in Champagne that figured this stuff out uh, going back. And also in the, the Penedes region of, of Spain near Barcelona where cavas are made. And so similarly, they do this traditional method with a bottle fermentation and aging and in contact with the yeast, and you, and you have that right written on the bottle, right? You know, method traditionnel, which is also exactly. champonnet, uh, you know, so there's many different names for it. Um, but that means it's it's made in the bottle and not a charmat where they make it in a big tank and then just pour it into bottles or anything like that. Correct. Tip, typically, you know, if it's less than $20 a bottle on a retail shelf, it's probably not made in the traditional method with the bottle fermentation. And it, it's a little, obviously a little more expensive to go through all, all of this process. And we'll age those wines typically longer. Uh, if it's a, a proposition where it's going to be less than $10, then almost always it's not involving a bottle fermentation and, and you can, uh, you can, basically sparkle wine straight out of a tank into bottles and, and, and away you go. So Carly Ann, um, I guess she's in Minnesota. She says it's minus 10 degrees in Minnesota right now. So you could just put the bottle outside and not have to work as much. So. You folks are nice and chilly there. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, we do have some rain and it's probably in the 50s. <laughs> so if I went outside without a jacket, I'd probably get about as cold as you folks do when you just walk outside. Then our noses do not freeze. So our noses do not freeze when we walk outside. Not not here, not not ever really, I'd say. It's 59 in the cellar, so it's not that much colder out in No, it's, it's yeah. It's it's Frank's a little more it's a little warmer today in the cellar than it is outside, right? And certainly tonight, you know, tonight it'll it'll drop down, we'll get down into the 30s. Ooh, boy, that's <laughs> Oh, so apparently it's minus 12 in Toronto at the moment. So um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, we can go up to the Sierra Nevada and, uh, and go skiing and uh, enjoy the snow. But truthfully, uh, unless we're up at like 12,000 or 13,000 feet, it's probably not that cold, even in our mountains. Right. Yeah. It gets down to 10, zero, but it's cold enough to have some nice snow. That's for sure. But that's we, don't, we don't need minus 12. No, no, no. <laughs> So there's a, a stack of bottles. Uh, uh, actually, uh, these guys are uh, unloading bottles from the uh, uh, the, the stack there, uh, rosé, and and then and then from there we'll we'll end up going to the um, to the actually excuse me these guys are loading rosé. That picture was taken a few years ago, but it gives you a sense for how these walls might be built up. The particular cave I'm in, the stacks are a little bit smaller. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a pretty shot. And so do you, um, you don't put any kind of, of netting or anything in front of it, do you? I don't see any in this picture or even behind you, so. The only thing that we do do uh, is there is the possibility that you would have, as the fermentation is happening, 
So in that first month of the life of the bottle in the cave, as the pressure is building up, uh, it's possible that a bottle or two are going to break, right? It's, we're, it's not, not a perfect world. So if you, you'll have some bottles that burst. So we do put a cover in front of the stack for a month or so while that fermentation is happening. And then once we know the fermentation is done, we pull, we pull the cover because after that, there's, there's really no uh, risk of bottles uh, popping. Okay. It's not like a huge deal, but you know, it would be bad, right? Well, I mean, that was, you know, back in history when, when um, um, Dom Perignon went to investigate why these bottles were exploding and, you know, killing a monk occasionally because it was shooting out at him. Um, but again, they had corks at that time, you know, now we've gotten better. We have the crown on there. So it, it keeps a little bit more strength on it and everything. Don't forget, yeah, the glass, the glass bottles are- the glasses were we're yeah. not really as strong, right? Or the wine bottles are definitely heavier than still wine bottles, although some Cabernet bottles are pretty <laughs> heavy, as it turns out. Uh, but that's more for show, I think. Uh, but yeah, these these sparkling wine bottles, they also have the nice punt in the base that right. gives an extra kind of level of durability. And so it's it's it, there just may be an imperfection in one bottle or another that uh, allows it to pop as the pressure is building up. Uh, but yeah, we, we've, we've done pretty well. Calocha is happy with us, so that's important. Knock on wood, it'll stay yeah. that way. And again, just more pictures. So, so how many bottles of sparkling do you make in a year? We are making about a million uh, a year. Uh, so we've obviously, from, the, the, from the, the, the first vintage, we made a couple thousand. So we, we've, we've grown a bit. Uh, we make the Blanc de Blanc. We make a Blanc de Noir, which is made from Pinot Noir. We make uh, the, the Strange Rosé. And those are the three that people are probably going to be the most familiar with. All brute styles are quite dry, but a, a Blanc style from Chardonnay and Noir style from, from, from Pinot. And then the Rosé, which involves a little bit of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and some Pinot that's fermented in contact with skins to give color. But above those three, then we do the, the J Shram, uh, the, the Strangler Reserve. Uh, and so the J Shram is our top uh, Chardonnay Brut, the Strangler Reserve, our top Noir style or Pinot Noir Brut. And then there's a J Shram Rosé. So that'll be, I think that the next one we'll, we'll try in our tasting. So that's two cool. levels. Uh, and then those three are aged for considerably longer, special select, you know, the, the best, Lots of the year are incorporated into the blend. Um, I talked a little bit about the range of vineyards. It might be interesting for people to consider. We're making over 300 individual base wines every year. And for the, the J Shram tier, maybe it's 25 of them, something like that, that we need, you know, that, that, that we go through the trouble to try to figure out what are the best lots of the year. And then we'll blend uh, a little bit of those, um, considerably more than of the Blanc de Blanc, Blanc Noir and Rosé. Uh, so at the this J Tram price point though we're up over hundred dollars right so this is I think one hundred and sixty dollars something like that is the the J Tram Rose so fun to share this with you guys thank you for including it in in the tasting um, typically these special select offerings that we do you know earn some pretty rave reviews at this stage uh, so we're proud of that I think this was in the uh, top one hundred you know uh, the the wine enthusiasts uh, list last year. Um, this is um, a style that we that, that I, I alluded to earlier, where we we do the considerable aging uh, on on the yeast. Sometimes that's referred to as extended tirage or uh, uh, late disgorge, you know, offerings. Uh, so seven years of aging with this particular bottle in contact with its yeast um, in a space uh, not too far be, behind me here. Uh, the twelve vintage. Uh, was really quite outstanding. This was a year that uh, was a, a bit more abundant in crop than was the case with the 16 uh, in, a, in a bit of a later year, which in terms of the harvest, which is, is typical if you have a bit more crop, it takes a little longer for it to, to reach maturity. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, you folks should probably really enjoy this one. I see. Uh... This is a style that we've made since about 1998. The first J Shram Brut, again, our top Blanc style, we did that in 87. And then we added the J Shram Rose in 98. So that's the, the package there. We do have somebody, um, looks like it's Stephanie. She's opening a 2004 J Shram tonight. So. Oh, very nice, very nice. Um, 
So the, the, uh, it, I love to hear that. And the, the one thing that is a little different about um, you know, our business today than would have been the case when I was a lot younger is that we have, uh, we have a deeper library, right? Uh, in 1975, uh, we couldn't taste, uh, we had one 10 year old bottle that we could taste, right? <laughs> Uh, that's it. And, and we didn't make that much of it. So there probably wasn't much left. Uh, uh, eventually, we, as, as we've gotten older, obviously, we, we make a little bit more every year, but we have many vintages now that we've made uh, crazy. I think we've done 56 vintages of Shramsburg sparkling wine. Um, that and would so be a great vertical. It, it, it can happen. It does happen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we, we don't have many, we don't have the visitation that we, we, we historically have had. So that's a little challenging, but, um, uh, we've done a couple of, uh, interesting kind of late disgorge and library vertical virtual tastings, uh, nothing like all 50 vintages. Um, but it's hard to, I, if we're going to do that, you want to have all the people to, to effectively taste in the same bottle. You know, it's, it's not the situation where you, you ship everybody. The bottles from your library right we don't, right. don't have that many don't have that many to do but here you get some really uh, glorious uh, 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 you know gently uh, glazed uh, uh, baked uh, fruit characters you know that, that the time in, in the bottle allows for uh, the, the, the caramelized tones to to evolve the vanillin tones to evolve um, perhaps even hints of savory notes right just just a little element of seasoning in some ways, uh, this wine is still fairly young. Uh, you know, if we come back to it when it's 20, someone's tasting a 2004 Jeshram, they'll probably see just a little bit more of these interesting savory seasoned uh, 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 characters, uh, salted, uh, toasted, uh, even potentially roasted characters. Here we're still in that, you know, kind of uh, gently baked, uh, nice, nicely uh, 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 caramelized tones. The, the aromas uh, come across and the flavors um, exhibiting some of that uh, gentle oxidation and, and, and age. The, the structure of the wine as we initially crafted it was so crisp and tart that as you taste it now with, with you know, several years of age, it, it, it enters crisp, it has this really long finish, which is the design, right? Which is the design. Uh, we're just today actually tweaking the, uh, the 2020 Jayshram Rosé blend. Uh, we've got our, our the, 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 the Pinot Noir base, uh, the, the, I should say the white Pinot Noir base with no, no skin contact, right? Then we've got the, the Chardonnay elements that, that are, are incorporated. We're, we're about 99% done with, with the blend and we, we were starting to determine just how much of a, of a Pinot that we fermented in contact with skins, our favorite of the year, would would be needed. We ended up at about 1.75 percent, to be technical. But anyway, these are the things we do, right? And then uh, from here, we'll we'll look at uh, you know, it, it, is there another little splash from an older barrel that might add just a little bit of richness and depth before we then uh, present it to the bottle? But so the 2020 won't see the light of day. Well, it looks like for another eight years or something. Like that. And that's that's done the same way. I mean, even in Champagne, right? Uh, it's it's the only rosé wine in France that is actually a blend of white and a red, you know. It's pretty cool. We don't think, I mean, I'm, I'm sure in the south of France, they're, they're, they're putting a little white wine into their rosés. Why not? Unless there's some prohibitive law that says you can't. Right. But um, I would say that's, if there is a prohibitive law like that, there, I can't think of a good reason for, for why that would be the case. Because a little tart, in our case, Chardonnay, Ah, that helps us give a little more crisp entry and a little more length of the finish and give that nice linear frame. And then, and then we can really coat that frame with luscious, glorious, tasty Pinot Noir, right? I mean, that's kind of what we're, we're doing. And so if you didn't have much of a spine to begin with, then it's kind of harder to, to, to layer in the, the really tasty and, and some of the more concentrated flavors. The other thing that's interesting to consider, and if I'm if I'm if I'm going off the track, you can loop me back in. But you start with with just as if you were to put a pie in the oven. You you don't want to have applesauce going into the oven, right? Right. Uh, the dough wants to be it's dough. You don't eat the dough. 
and in, in the same way, we don't want to really drink the wine that we're putting the bottle. It's 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 a little lean and tart, right? But we know that with 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 time, it's going to evolve into this this very tasty thing. And so it's pretty fun to um, to go through the the exercise a year in year out. You start to get a sense for what it's supposed to taste like before it goes to the bottle. And this is drinking wonderful. It's been a number of years since I've had uh, the, the J. Schramm Rosé. So um, thank you for re reminding me why I like it so much. <laughs> so. It's exciting. I mean, honestly, there are folks that, well, you know, think, you know that, that you, you can't make real champagne unless you are a champagne. You know, they, somehow they, they, they've cornered the market on, on, on how you can make a, a really beautiful sparkling wine. And I would challenge anyone to to go find you know the, the the very whatever someone considers to be the very best rosé champagnes from France. They're probably all really good, right? No, I'm not saying they're bad. You throw this one in that lineup, and you will be very impressed, right? I mean, that, that's our our goal is uh, you know not to take anything away from what they're doing, but we we definitely play right in in, in that league. We like what we do. It tends to be a little 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 higher in its acidity. We almost have to. Uh, push a little harder to get people's attention in that regard because we're in California and it's warm and you know it's like it is kind of warm but out next to Pacific Ocean it's actually pretty cold it is yeah it's pretty cold you don't even swim in our ocean right it's not the Mediterranean it's the Pacific come on that was beautiful so so we have a couple of folks here um well Angela's complaining that you only make a million a year um, she doesn't know what the rest of the people are going to drink because she, I know Angela and she can, yeah, she can come close to that. So, um, there's a lot of French champagne out there. <laughs> there's a million sounds like a lot. Um, uh, although what there are 360 million Americans. So, uh, and with that 8 billion people on the planet. So not everybody's drinking travel, uh, every year. Um, but yeah, the, 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 this, the, the quantity relative to say that champagne district, you know, there are 25, 30 million cases every year, right. Uh, times 12 bottles, right. So now we're getting a big number, uh, three, 300 million, 400 million bottles and we make a million. So we're, we're on the board, but it's a, yeah. But you you saw sales go up for 20, right. Of your sparklers. Uh, no, well, Towards the end, it started looking better for sure. So I, I will, I will be. Uh, but the April, May, June, that that was not uh, that was not so good. Yeah, yeah. That was, and so you know, all in, um, you know, we I felt like we tread, we we started to tread water pretty well. We're we're good. Um, but in that earlier moment, it was you know, it was always a little frightening. Uh, honestly, the when the the stock market crashed in what was 08, 09, right? The, oof, there was a little bit of a yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, hey uh, gut check. Um, worse, worse than both of these, I'd say for our business. And again, the pandemic, we're not through. I don't know where, where exactly we're headed. Hopefully it, it, it'll, it'll get better from here. It seems like it is. But that 01, 02, kind of after 9 11, that was very tough. And for me, that was, I was uh, in my, you know, what, uh, 30, you know, early, early, late thirties yeah, and, kind of. and running a wine business. And, and, uh, uh, my dad was no longer alive and, and my mom was here and, hey, you know, what do we, you know, it's a little bit, how do we figure this out? Cause you can't change what, what is out of your control. Right. You, know, you can only it. adapt to it. So, yeah, so that's it. And so, so what kind of changes did you make for the pandemic in your marketing? And, you know, did you go more to your it, wine club or, cause you're, you do a lot of we, sales through restaurants as well. Yeah, you're right. I mean, so for us, um, you know, it, the the, the on-premise, we say on-premise hotel restaurant business was, you know, about 40%. And then you also couple that with the visitation business that you're doing, right? And then, well, we don't have the visitors. Uh, so we've had some, but I mean, that we're probably, I don't know, 70% down on, on this, just like headcount. So then you have to do more digitally. Uh, there has to be more internet business. Uh, you've worked with Matt a little bit setting this up, but Matt, uh, among other things, 
uh, drives the, the, our, our internet program. And so more email communication. If you are one of those people that gets an email from transfer once a week, <laughs> thank you for not uh, like uh, uh, unsubscribing. Uh, and I think our club members have, have, have hung in there pretty well for us as well, maybe picking up a little bit towards the end of the year. And then I would say retail business in general across the country uh, has been pretty good. And, and honestly, we don't do a ton of export business, but even our export business uh, did not also, you know, it, 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 we were in real wonder earlier, but things picked up towards the end of the year. So we know it's, it's, it's being sold more through retail stores and we know that it's being sold more, we say direct to consumer where people are ordering the wine directly from us and, and, and we're shipping it that way too. And um, so Alec is asking, um, how exactly did 9-11 affect Schomsburg? He's asking reduced exports, but you just say you don't do a lot of exporting. So I assume it's just in, the, in this country, I know a lot of us just kind of like didn't know what to expect next, right? So we just kind of stopped spending money all of a sudden. And, and especially for, you know, semi-luxury products like this, you know, it's like, do I want to spend the money on a bottle of, of champagne or sparking wine? or save it up for the moment, so. So back to that 9-11, there are two things. One, uh, as we got to the end of the, the 20th century, there was a buildup of demand for sparkling wine. And so the, up to that point, our best year ever, for sure was 99. Oh boy, you know, that that was, that the end of 1999, it was really, it was pretty good. Relatively, you know, until now we're a little bigger, but, and so, we had, we kind of, we ramped up and then not only did we, we, the party was over, right? So the party ends, but then 9-11 happens. And so from the, from the peak to the valley, there was a 30% less business. So that, that, that was a big, that was a big slide, you know, from, from like our best year to like, you know, a year or two later. It was, and so we stayed down there a little bit. And then by 2005, six things were picking back up again. But I, uh, hopefully this, this dip will not be uh, like that. It, it doesn't feel like it's going to be that bad for us. You know, for somebody else, it might be. And, you know, hopefully we're all kind of uh, equally dig our way out of here. But sometimes the world isn't, uh, isn't equal, right? right. Uh, as much as we want it to be, some, there's not always parity. And I can certainly sympathize from being a wine tourism company where 19 was our best year ever. And going into 20 when um, we did no tours. <laughs> so so um, we're looking forward to 21 and we're really looking forward to 22. That's our, that's our, our breakout year. So, so back to um, the rosé, um, Carla Ann is asking, what would you pair with this? So we right. are coming up with, thank, with um, Valentine's Day here. And so, um, you know, some people may have some, extra bottles stashed away and, and want to open one up on Sunday. So what would you pair with this? Well, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, that's a, that's a good day, right? I, I, you know, this, I think with, um, it depends on how uh, there are, there's a broad range of things you can do. Come, straight to mind would be, um, you know, a little, um, maybe a, a little, little, little uh, toast point with a little bit of creme fraiche and a little bit of caviar and bam, right? May sound kind of um, fussy, but it's pretty easy. Actually, you just <laughs> toast the red, little pieces and creme fraiche and delicious caviar with, it could be the j Shram, it could be the j Shram Rosé. That, that might be a really nice thing for, for Valentine's Day. If you're, if you're splurging on the wine, might as well splurge on the, on the right. a little bit. Uh, that is, uh, but honestly, these, it can be a little bit more simple than that. I think there are, uh, um, we, we, I, I love these, these wines that with, uh, with the oysters on the half shell, they can be served with things that are as simple as potato chips, you know, that, that are really nice potato chips, heavily salted, uh, things that are, are, are fried. In general, fish uh, preparations, whether with a, with a rosé, while well, a nice uh, salmon filet uh, could be absolutely delicious. Um, you can also, I think, uh, match this wine, which has this interesting pinot base with uh, pork preparations, you know, so as we're thinking about like maybe more of an entree, 
believe me, it could, it could be served in a larger glass. You know, this is a, this is a pretty serious wine at the end of the day. Yes, yeah. uh, so whole fish, uh, pork, uh, poultry preparations as well, I think are all in play here. Probably not the best wine for the filet mignon, you know, I, I would say, but uh, you could try that too. Uh, but it, it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it, if you have uh, this notion that you're going to serve it before a meal and, and, you, and, you, and you want it to be a little more simple than that, uh, a range of charcuterie and cheeses and nuts Perfect, right? I, I think this 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 wine will complement uh, that that type of a range of food as well. And I, I can tell you, with your Blanc de Blanc, I have had that um, with my share of fried chicken. You know, it is a um, a great pairing that's with fried chicken. That's great. Uh, so we've done this uh, fried chicken and Jayshram uh, <laughs> tasting. Actually, your the image behind you is down at the Davies Winery, where we make our red wines. But we do uh, we we can offer tastings there as well of our red portfolio and and sometimes the sparkling as well. So we've done the Jayshram fried chicken uh, weekends. Uh, in in the young life of our Davies tasting room down there, and those have those have been a hit. Yeah. You know. I don't know if you were to do, you know, if, if it was pizza, I'd want it to be probably thin crust, right? And, and very crispy. And, and uh, that, that might work pretty darn well uh, as well, actually. There's, you know, rosés are really versatile. Pinot Noir is very versatile as, a, as I think, you know, I wouldn't be the first wine person to tell you that, you know, Pinot Noir is the, the wine that kind of goes with everything, right? It's, it's a, a light bodied, Red wine. All right. So now we're we're not quite red, but we're uh, we're, we're pink. More beautiful so, color. So it works right. out. <laughs> this uh, rosé is is a fuller bodied white wine, and so and whites whites can cover a good spread. And Carly Ann says that she does have the caviar, um, and she's also loving the potato chips. So maybe you maybe can the caviar on the potato chips. Potato chip with a little bit of creme fraiche and the caviar that and fail on the toast point. Then you don't have to you don't have to do the toasting. All you have to do is get the tasty chips, creme fraiche, caviar, done. I can tell you my other half is from Pennsylvania, which of course is the snack food capital of the world. And um, we get the potato chips when we go up there. And of course, they're made with potatoes, lard, and salt. There's nothing else in the ingredients. It's just three ingredients. And so um, it's kind of a perfect potato chip. You don't have to worry about any kind of it's it's healthy as healthy can be for a potato chip when you have that much lard in there, but the flavors really come through. So um, let's see, yeah. Fried chicken, waffles, popcorn, grilled cheese, oysters. Yeah, so everything. So it's gonna be a lot of good um, food served tonight through Valentine's Day, I guess. <laughs> I think fortunately for those of us who are in the sparkling industry, uh, we are, we're, there was a time when people really thought about sparkling wines for celebration only, like you would only have the sparkling wine, you'd only have the champagne if you were celebrating. And, and we've seen a nice uptick uh, you know, in, in demand for sparkling wine over these last couple of decades. And it, I think people are starting to realize that you know, delicious sparkling wine goes very well with a range of foods, right? And, so it doesn't have to be uh, you know, relegated to that, that, that particular moment when we're celebrating a bride or a birthday or Christmas or New Year's or something like that. Kevin says, every day is a celebration. So open up some bubbles. Yeah. And, and bubbles kind of makes it feel special. That's Absolutely. Right. So that, and nowadays we need to celebrate every day, right? <laughs> so. Especially these days, say hey, we'll take it. You know, small victories. Like I got the bottle open. I've got, I've got some potato chip creme fraiche and I've got some caviar and I got a cheese shrimp rosé. It's not too bad. That's right. It's good. Life's good. So let's see what we got here now. Um, we'll continue on. Um, so this was the, the, the rosé. So now we're going to look at Davies Vineyard. So this is still part of the, Sh the Schramsberg company, I guess, but a, a separate label, right? A second label on you. Second label, uh, you know, still wines, red wines at this stage, uh, and then a different facility in, in St. Helena. Uh, the, the, the whole concept really was born as we got better and better with our Chardonnay and Pinot vineyards in cooler pockets of what we call the North Coast. We talked about the Anderson Valley, the Sonoma Coast, the Marin County, uh, Carneros. 
initially we were going Chardonnay Pinot Noir on our property and working with other vineyards in close proximity to our property here in the Singlina, Calistoga, you know, northern part of the Napa Valley inland, further in from the, uh, from the bay. And so as we came to realize that we were having more success with these cooler sites with the varietals that we needed for the sparkling wine, uh, what do we do with the 46 acres of vineyard that we have on our home property? Wow, we're in the Diamond Mountain District of Napa. And certainly uh, not as much in the 60s, but by the time we got to the 90s, Diamond Mountain meant something for Cabernet. Uh, and there were, there were producers, uh, uh, Diamond Creek, Von Strasser, Reverie, et cetera, that, that were starting to have some, some really fine success with Cabernet uh, in, this, in, in the hills around us. Uh, similarly in hills around the, the broader valley. And so uh, we jumped in and started growing Cabernet in 94. By uh, 2001, we were bottling our first vintage. We call it the, the J Davies Cabernet, uh, not to be confused with the Davies brand. The Davies is now our kind of the, the, the name of the, 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 the full set of, of Cabernets and Pinot Noirs that we do. And there's a Davies winery, but inside that set is the J Davies Estate Cabernet. So this is just made from the vineyards, the 46 acres that I talked about that are on the home property. And we do a couple iterations uh, from the home property. This is the principal one. Tonight we have a 2014. Uh, so this is this should be beautiful, uh, uh, six years old. Uh, typically we sell the wine when it's three. And so here we have a, a vintage with a, a little bit of additional age to, to taste with you. Uh, there is a, uh, another bottling that we started doing in 2012, which is called the Jamie. So we named that after my mom and it, it's the JDB's Jamie, bears her signature. And that one's of course a little more expensive. We age it for four years before we release uh, and it's uh, quite tasty. That, that's kind of the special uh, eight barrel blend at this stage where, where this one might be um, more like a, an 80 barrel blend, if you will. Who's the, who's the J, J Davies? My dad, Jack. Jack. And so my dad uh, predeceased my mom. Um, he died in 98. So we we're on the track with the with the growing the fruit and starting to dabble with making the wine. Uh, by 2001, my mom was still here. And so I had a nice 10 years working with my mom and, and moving the business forward. And, and then we, we would bottle it. By 2004, we were selling our first vintage. But we wanted to honor my dad by naming the wine after him. So the J. Davies Estate, uh, Cabernet, uh, we've made then since 2001 and been selling it since 2004. The shot here takes you to the Davies Winery where um, we are, are, are able to present the, the, the red wines that we make. We have administrative offices there and, and, and tasting facility. Uh, John, you're sitting in, in a space or it appears that you are with our JD, uh, the, the Davies Barrel uh, yep. Shape behind you, right? So that that's kind of cool to look at. But that's all in St. Helena on Main Street, just on the south side of town, north of uh, Louis Martini Winery. If, if people are familiar with, uh, you know, kind of the uh, some of the other locations in. Uh, you said it used to be a used car lot or a, a car dealership. Right? This was this. So that we actually expanded the building, but the, the your that that shot there is inside uh, what at one point was the the GM dealer in St. Helena. And for about 60 years. So in 2008, 2009, uh, GM closed a number of dealerships around the country, including the one in St. Helena. St. Helena is a pretty small town, right? There are about 5,000 people. So uh, better deals are had in places like Santa Rosa or even the city of Napa or out on Interstate 80 in Fairfield or something like that. So that explains why all the dealerships moved into, into Santa Rosa. I noticed over the past 10 years, there's a lot more dealerships in Santa Rosa than there used Santa to be. Rosa has a quarter. They have a freeway. At the end of the day, 101, yeah. Yeah, there are more cars drive up and down, and so they, they get more traffic. Um, and that's okay. I think in St. Helena, we're happy to not have that. Yes, we, we, no. uh, I've, been, I've been on that traffic <laughs> before. So. so delicious wine here. We talked about uh, 2014. This was uh, uh, actually the, the third vintage row where we had relatively low um, low amounts of rainfall. And so the, the vines were starting to, to grow a little bit less, a little less crop in, in 14 than certainly was the case in 12, a slightly earlier harvest. Um, but uh, a vintage where it really became, uh, I don't wanna say easy to, to sound negative, but to, to get the fruit to ripen, to kind of get to, the, to a nice, uh, plush, delicious finish line with, with the fruit in the vineyard. Uh, that worked pretty well in 2014. 
And so uh, we, we enjoy this vintage, enjoy uh, uh, this chance to present this particular wine. We do work with uh, Malbec as, as a blender. In this case, actually 17% of the blend is, is Malbec. So it's labeled as a Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, in this case, about 80% uh, Cabernet and a little touch of Petit Verdot as well, about 3% Petit Verdot. The what Petit color? Verdot kind of fills in the, the, the back of the palate, uh, but the, the Malbec really lifts this nice uh, dark berry center, um, giving the one beautiful fragrance, flavor. Got some nice tannins, smooth tannins that are, you can see they're beginning to integrate, you know. Um, mm. So here, you're, this wine, 14 would have been bottled in 16. So four years in the bottle, that's nice, right? I mean, the, the people, there's a reason why people put bottles into the cellar and, and, yep. and watch them evolve over the course of time. We talked a lot about that with, with sparkling wines earlier in the program, but hey, hey you know, it, definitely with Cabernet, right? Uh, and so truth be told, people age Cabernet more than they're, they're aging their sparkling wines. Yes. So. I'm there, I know there's some folks out there aging their sparkling wines. Whoever's got the 2004 uh, Day Shrimp, thank you. That's good. Oh, Stephanie, she, she, has, she has, has a um, vertical of um, four through 10. So, um, Very nice. Stephanie, Very nice. I'll be coming to see you in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, when, when, when are you going to have the party after COVID? We want to. <laughs> we'll be there. Yeah. No, this is beautiful wine. And, um... So, our oldest Cabernet is 2001. So we, we can't go back. I did have a, a 96 uh, transfer Blanc de Blanc uh, over this last weekend. Uh, I was hoping I, it was during the Super Bowl. I actually popped that. Uh, my brother was over and um, uh, his kids who are now getting older, old enough to, to, to sip a little wine, right? Um, but uh, we wanted the, uh, the Chiefs to win, not the Bucks. So we, we didn't, we weren't really celebrating, but we opened the bottle that we, we planned to celebrate. Hopefully there aren't any, you know, real serious Bucks or Tom Brady fans on, on the program. Well, um, you know, it's... Um, if they're there, they're probably beating their chest anyway. So hey, they, not, they're not gonna I, I was for letting, letting the new generation come in and, you know, start a new dynasty. So this is beautiful. Uh, and I, um, I picked up a, a couple of good um, ribeyes that I'm going to grill up to serve with this tonight. So um, I think it will go beautiful with this. So... Hmm. No, I think it's it. Um, the the one factor that's really exciting about this particular bottle today is that that notion of a little additional bottle time. I think it, you know you, you feel the the really um, delicious resolution in terms of the the tannin on the palate. You know, it's it's a strong wine. Uh, there, there's there's some really beautiful flavor in there. It's not all uh, blackberries and, and uber ripe, right? There, there's, uh, you know, elements of uh, uh, interesting, you know, tobacco sweetness, uh, a little uh, other uh, spice notes that, that are in, incorporated and layered. The use of barrels, I mean, could go on is, is key. In making these wines, though, the Cabernet, um, everything is destemmed. So we're, we're just working with the berries. Uh, we do not ferment with stems, and we try to end up with really uh, very clean berries that make their way into the into the fermenter. Um, there's not uh, crushing. Uh, there, there's enough. There's enough concentration. There's enough tannin in the fruit to begin with, right? We don't need to. Let, let's put some stems in there. Let, let's put some. Uh, make sure the seeds are squished a little bit. So uh, there's. Yeah. And normally we're, we're good already on on the, the structure and the tannin, and so the, our our job is to try to really dial in the ideal day to pitch pick each block uh, on the property. We talked about forty six acres. At the end of the day, we'll do probably thirty five different picks uh, on the property, uh, carefully selecting you know that corner, and then you know a couple of days later that that one over there, or maybe we'll pick these two on one day. But you get the point, and, and then vinifying separately each of the different pockets. And then we've got a little Malbec here, we've got a little Petit Verdot there. We, we do work with Merlot and Kempfron, but we, 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 we make this range of components. And then, and then it's uh, with, with a nice range of components, it's obviously a lot easier to craft the delicious blend. Right, yeah, that's beautiful. And, um, so I do have a bottle of this sitting in my cellar from the first time we visited you somewhere around 
I don't know, it was somewhere around 10 or 11, somewhere around there when we first visited you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We have our, you know, a common friend, Peter Kester, who I, uh, he's on here tonight, who um, you went to college with him. There we go, Bowdoin College, let's go. Polar Bears. He's the one that first introduced me to, to, to Schramsberg and to you, and you, you've been so good to us over the years. And um, yeah, we, um, I can't wait to go back and, and, and go back through the cellar. You know, um, Stephanie was talking about the, the cave, the cave tasting. Yeah, you do some beautiful tastings inside the cave and, and you get to um, bring a jacket because even though you, you know, it's summertime in Napa, it's quite chilly in the cave. So. <laughs> I'm wearing a sweater. It's it's up like 59 degrees inside here. It, uh, also consider the visit to Davy. So you, that that's um, obviously a different experience, but I, I think you would have you would have fun uh, checking us out um, and there and, and kind of exploring the the Pinot and the Cab program. Just to speak to that, we do a, a little range of of sparklings. We've talked about that. Uh, frankly, at this stage, maybe 12 or 14 different sparkling wines, every vintage that we're, we're, we're crafting. On the red wine side, we have uh, uh, about six different Pinot Noir vineyards that we're working with. And so we'll do a, a, a vineyard designate from each one of those sites, some Anderson Valley, Sonoma Coast, uh, Carneros. And then with Cabernet, we've got our Diamond Mountain property, but we are doing some uh, vineyard designate cabs. There's a red cap up on Hell Mountain that's quite tasty. Uh, Renteria in Oakville. Uh, there's a Coombsville vineyard called Simpkins, uh, to name a couple of the others. And we're actually now doing a St. Helena uh, a blend as well. So yeah, it's uh, an evolving little program uh, that uh, it would be, if, if you're one, when we can have guests inside and do all that again, we'd love to, uh, might be fun to do some barrel tasting down there. We'll be happy to join you. Yeah, because you were not open last time I was, I think I, last time I was in, Napa was probably around August of 19, I think. Uh -huh. um, so you were just opening up around that time, right? The... We opened in St. Lena in uh, May of 17. Oh, 17, okay. So, so, think... so we had, uh, we were open for three years and then we've, uh, we've, we've <laughs> largely been closed. It's terrible, we've been largely been closed for a whole year already, uh, but, We've, we, you know, we really have been able to keep the staff and, and it's a lot of phone calls and emails and, and that, you know, engaging with our customers. And it's, it's, it's interesting. We're, we're still, you know, our team is staying busy. They're just not doing exactly what we envisioned them doing when we opened the facility down there. So I have to say, um, so Stephanie apparently is a huge fan of yours. Not only does she have the old four to 10 of the, of the Schwamm, she also has the eight through 11 of Jay Davies. There you go. We're definitely going to be hitting your house, Stephanie, once the party starts. <laughs> um, oh, Peter says, go you bears. So, okay, there you go. <laughs> if you go I will mention there is a, a wine auction. If anyone's like super excited, we have, we're participating in, with the Nat Valley Vintners, a library wine auction. So we, it actually, the auction just went live today. It goes until the 20th of February, but there are the lot that we Put together for that auction. I think there are about 100 lots. Is six magnums of uh, J. Davies Cab, one through six, and six magnums of J. Shram. And so six sparkling, six reds, and the six uh, J. Shram magnums are pretty tasty. I think it would go from 90 to 2007. Not every vintage, but six in that. So yeah, nice set. If you're motivated, hey, who knows? Maybe the bidding will be good. It's COVID. We don't know. But we're trying to help or raise a little money for our our, uh, uh, our association and our, our efforts here. Right, a lot, a lot of that, for those who don't, aren't familiar with the, their, um, the auction that goes on every year, a lot of it goes to help um, charities and to help uh, the industry who might not you know, be working right now, the Psalms and you know, some of those other folks are also getting some assistance from the Napa Valley Vintners Association. So um, be sure to check that out. I think it's just napavalley.org org if i remember right um but if not google it google it's knows it all it'll, it'll come up but yeah that auction is 11 i think feb 11 through the 20th it's the first time we've done a uh library wine auction and it uh it's happening right now so there you go and all magnums for, age yeah. longer and you can have more people over when you open them so that's right you'd have a yeah you'll you'll have the you'll have a nice set you'll have a nice set for sure 
So um, let's see if there are any last questions in here. I'm trying to look to see, I think, um, yeah, Steve says they were heading there in March, but had, of course, had to cancel, hopefully be back. Um, NapaVentners.com is, is the address. Um, .com, that sounds right. Take a look at that. Um, yes, and we will have, um, we'll, we'll be booking tours to Napa, Sonoma as soon as um, we're able to, you know, we're hoping to maybe do something late this year, you know, once, um, you know, everybody get your shot, you know, um, or both shots, actually, I guess, you know, um, so that we can all travel again. Um, so we, um, we, we do go to Napa, Sonoma um, at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, and if demands there, we'll go three times a year. So um, if you're interested, please, you know, drop me a note. We'll be happy to um, put together a tour and have you come join us and we'll visit Hugh and, and visit Davies and Schwann. We can make a day of it between the two. There you go. We'll, we'll put together uh, a great experience, absolutely. Because there's that great little, um, oh, what's it called? The burger place in between. Um, uh, what is it? God's Roadside. God's Roadside. Yep. So, you know, we, we can start with the sparklers and we'll grab a burger. And these aren't just your regular burgers. These are phenomenal burgers. And then we can hit Jay Davies after after lunch. So that'd be a, a, a wonderful day. So, um, so I don't see any other questions in here. So I just want to thank uh, Hugh. Thank you so much for sharing your wines. And, and it, it's quite obvious how passionate you are about your wines. And it comes through in every glass and every sip. Um, Matthew, who's who's sitting there in front of you, you know, helping out and has, has been um, he, helpful to me. <laughs> so, um, and of course, I want to thank Peter Kester again for um, help facilitating this between us. Um, and we look forward to um, to um, seeing you um, again in, a, in um, as soon as we can. Um, now, let me uh, just remind everybody what's coming up here. Um, oops, sorry, wrong screen. Let me try that again. Yeah, that's it. Okay, here we go. So you can see um, next week, oh, sorry, it's not switching over like I would like it, but we'll be in Australia next week um, to um, try some of the Shiraz out of uh, Heathcote and Trillion. This is um, a fairly new wine into the US, so you'll be uh, among the first people in the country to try it. Um, week after that, we go to the Cote de Rhone uh, with Chateau saint -Nabour. Um, we'll be trying some of the, the Cote de Rhone's from there. And then um, starting in March, um, we're going to have a full month of female winemakers as we celebrate Women's History Month. Um, and we'll be starting off in South Africa um, with Glenelli, um, which was um, founded by this wonderful lady. Um, she's in her 90s now, so she may or may not be there, but we are going to have um, her, her chief um, uh, marketer on there who's going to take us through the wines because um, it's going to be quite late, as you can imagine, in South Africa. It'll be past midnight, so she may not be able to join us. So um, let me just see what else. Um, thank you so much, everybody. And Hugh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we will see you um, hopefully within the year. So take care, everybody. That would be great. Happy Valentine's, everybody. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Peter. Uh, great to connect with you virtually. Uh, and uh, hopefully the next time it'll, it'll be live and in person. We'll, we'll look forward to it. Sounds great. So everybody, stay safe, drink wine, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Excellent.